Today is the day of our brand new series, 12 messages in all that will reveal the grace of God in someone's life whom the Bible calls is a man after God's own heart. Who is this person? We have a description of this person, handsome, a ruddy complexion, which means kind of reddish. He's a redhead, beautiful eyes, the youngest of eight sons, which kind of symbolizes the fact that he was considered insignificant. When you're the youngest of eight, you're considered insignificant. His name was David. The world that David was born into, in those days, people were drifting away from God. Samuel was the last of the judges, and he was an old man. God had appointed judges to rule Israel. Samuel was getting old. The present generation had not personally known the great days of Israel, nor had they known the days of Samuel's strength when he was in his prime. And I think like our young people today in America, they too have not known the strength of our country, what it was built upon, what made America great. And we seem to be drifting away from the foundation of this country. It's happening today and it happened even in the days of Israel. The Jewish people forgot that Samuel, in his strength, he subdued the Philistines and he judged the land very wisely. But as he got older, we're going to see what happened. First Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. It came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abijah, Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, this was a heartbreak. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. This poor leadership, now that Samuel's sons were the judges, and they were poor judges, it caused the people to become disillusioned. And they no longer wanted to be ruled by judges. They'll say, like, this judge thing, it's not working anymore. We don't want judges. We want a king. In verse 5, they said to Samuel, Behold! You know what behold means? Look! Look at that! It's like, Samuel, look at you! Look at yourself! You've grown old. Your sons don't walk in your ways. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Three reasons why they wanted a king. Number one, Samuel got old. He was out of his strength. Number two, his children walked away from God. They did a lousy job of ruling the people. See, whenever you get away from God, you do a lousy job of anything. I believe that. That it's in your relationship with God that you get really good at what you do. You walk away from God, pfft, you're going to get lousy at what you do. These guys walked away from God, pfft, they fell flat on their face. And then thirdly, the third reason they wanted a king, oh, they wanted to be like other nations. We want to be like other people. One of the biggest mistakes somebody can make is to want to be like somebody else. Now, be you. Be who you are. Don't try to be like somebody else. Now here, the majority, they rule, they got their way, but you know what? They were wrong. In verse 6, Samuel did the right thing with his problem. He took it to the Lord in prayer. 
It says, the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And you know what Samuel did? He prayed to the Lord. See, you should always make a connection between your problem and prayer. They should always be connected. You got a problem? Pray. That's the best thing to do. Don't get on the phone and call your best friend. You don't have to go on Dr. Phil. How can anybody expose that stuff to, to the world? Are they like crazy? Yes. If you've got a problem, pray. Samuel had a big problem. His sons did a lousy job of ruling. The people were fed up. They wanted to be like everybody else. Where do you go when you got a problem? You go to God. So the people got their way. God gave them what they wanted, even though what they wanted wasn't the best thing. God will do that. Be careful what you want. So they chose a man named Saul. Who's this guy Saul? He's tall, dark, handsome, head and shoulders above everybody else. When Saul stood in a crowd, he was taller than every, from his shoulders up, he was taller than everybody else. They looked at him and he's like, oh, he looks like a king. He looked really good on the outside, but he had some shortfalls. He was hot-tempered. He was given to seasons of depression. He had murder in his heart. Let me tell you something. Don't hang around a guy that's hot-tempered that carries a spear. You never want to do that. Okay? Saul was not known for having a strong relationship with God. But he was the people's choice. So they chose him. And though the people had asked God for a king, and he did grant their request, even though it wasn't his perfect will, it wasn't what he wanted for them, he granted what they wanted. But you know the great thing about God? He didn't abandon them when things fell apart. Oh, that's so good to remember. That sometimes we make wrong decisions. Anybody ever make a wrong decision beside me? Good. I don't feel so bad. And it's good to know that when you make a wrong decision, God does not abandon you. He doesn't. You know why? Because he's faithful. God is faithful. He knows we're not perfect. He knows we do dumb things. We say dumb things. But he never abandons us. And that's why sometimes in our bad decision... God is still there, and God can pick us up, and God can get us going again. Now, later on in 1 Samuel 13, Samuel came to King Saul. Saul was still the king, and he said to Saul, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment that the Lord gave you. If you had, you would have remained king, but now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. See, Saul disqualified himself because he did some things that were like against God. Like he went to war and God said, don't bring back any spoils of war. He brought back spoils of war. He tried to, he got involved in necromancy, summoning the dead after Samuel died, tried to bring Samuel back from the dead. God's like, you don't bring people back from the dead. He, um, time and time again, operated in the wisdom of his own flesh, which is not wisdom, than rather than the commandments of God. He made an offering. He's supposed to wait for the priest. And he's like, where the heck's that priest? I can't wait. Like, where's he going? So he made his own offering without waiting for the priest. And God says, you don't make offerings. Only the priest makes the offering. So he had these three strikes against him. So God removed him from being king. So now he's like in deep trouble. When the people sought the first king, they looked upon his physical stature. Now God's looking for the second king. And when God looks, seeks a leader... He looks upon the man's spiritual stature. 
Man looks at the outward appearance, ah, oh, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. That's what God is looking for. See, anybody can look good on the outside. Saul did. But God's not interested. God's not impressed by what we say, what we do, how we look, how Christian we appear to be. No, you know what God's interested in? The invisible world, in the heart, that nobody knows what's going on there except you and him. That's it. That's hidden. That's for, I don't know what's going on in your heart. You don't know what's going on in mine. Uh-oh, God does. And God looks at the heart. Now, the good news is, in spite of the condition you might be in physically, strong or weak, sickly or healthy, rich or poor, it doesn't matter. If your heart is right, oh man, God can use you because he's interested in the heart. What does it take to be a servant of God? A good heart, a godly heart. That's all it takes. The physical is not that important. It's what's going on on the inside. And that's what God used to choose the next king of Israel. And you know what else? God is still in the business of choosing people that he would use today. And again, he's still looking at hearts. The Bible tells us, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God's looking for people whose heart belongs to him. In other words, you've given God your heart, and he's got it to keep. God is looking for you. Oh man, he's got big plans for you. Now, when God chooses his servant leaders, he uses three simple priorities. Number one, he looks for spirituality. Spirituality means I have a connection with God. That's all. I have a relationship with God. I like hanging out with God. I walk through the day with God. I have a God consciousness. That's spirituality. I know I have flesh and I fight my flesh, but you know what? In the end, I know God's will for my life and I want to maintain my relationship with God. He's looking for that. Number two, piety. Now, piety is not a modern word today, but it means simply devotion, devoted to God. He's looking for people that are devoted to him. Now, why is that so important? Because, man, I'll tell you what. It's so easy to be distracted from God. It's so easy. It's so easy to get mad at God, to get upset at him, to say, that's it, I'm done, I've had enough. I was thinking the other day about all the people that I know that used to be so fired up for God and for church and thinking about where they are today, a lot of them. I'm like, they're not even walking with God. They're not going to church. They're like, in their mind, they're right back where they were when God found them. And I'm like, wow, how does that happen? You've got to be devoted. It's tough. It's tough to stick with God. It's tough. There are so many things that work against us. Failure, loss, separation, anxiety, depression, discouragement. So many things try to pull us away from God. Letdowns. But you see, if you're devoted, you expect things to try to pull you away. So you set your mind. I know there are things in life they're going to try to pull me away from God. I'm making up my mind right now. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. And then thirdly, God looks for humility. Humility is reliance on God. A humble person says, I don't have all the answers, but I know God does. So I'm going to learn from him that, you know what? A humble person allows God to speak to them and help them with the important decisions of their life. Now, wait a minute. Here's the catch. If you only have a little bit of God's word in your soul, God can only speak to you a little bit. If you have a lot of God's word, he can speak to you a whole bunch more because you have the language. Like, let's say, okay, you're going to go to France and you know four words. 
Well, when you get to France and you use those four words, you're not going to have a lot of dialogue with four words. But if you go to France and you've got a whole French vocabulary, you can get around a, ho a whole lot better and have a better time. So the more of the Word of God you have, the more you're able to hear God because God speaks through His Word. So again, there's another commitment. Oh, I've got to learn the Scriptures. Because if I learn the Scriptures, God has more to speak to me with, and then I can operate in reliance upon Him. So these are the makings, spirituality, piety, humility of God's servant leaders, okay? Now question, how do you know if you have the heart of a servant? Right, as Christians, you know, we're told all the time, you got to be a servant. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to be a servant of all. And we probably, most people here would say, oh, I'm a servant. How do you know if you're a servant? Here's how you know. How do you feel when somebody treats you like one? That's how you know. If somebody treats you like a servant, and they say, do this, you're like, who do you think you're talking to? Well, then you're not a servant. But if somebody says, do this, okay, you're a servant. You see, a servant doesn't, doesn't you know, um, live in their rights. A servant serves. Jesus was the greatest servant. He did everything the Father asked him to do. Jesus never like, wait a minute, I'm God, you know, I don't have to do this. No, Father, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. That's the heart of a servant. Christ gave nobility to servanthood. The highest level in life is the level of servanthood. Ain't that a kicker? In the world, they say, the more servants you have, the better you are. In Christ, the more people you serve, the better you are. It's upside down. It's a backwards kingdom. Now, let's get into what our message is about today. God's schoolhouse of learning. God has certain training methods that he uses to prepare his people for leadership, responsibility, whatever it is he has them to do. David was being trained for God's leadership role by doing the work of a shepherd. Isn't that interesting? God went not to the military school, but to the sheepfold to find the next king of Israel. The work of the shepherd was a lonely and monotonous work. And David had a four-fold training ground as he was being prepared to be the next king of Israel. The first one is solitude. What is solitude? The ability to be alone with yourself in order to resolve your inner conflicts. Solitude. You know, a lot of people, when they're like all alone, they think there's something wrong. I'm all alone. I don't have any friends. Nobody calls me. Nobody loves me anymore. No, that's wrong. There are times that we have to be alone. That solitude is one of the tools that God uses to train us. This is where David learned to be king. Solitude was one of the teachers that God used to train him for the throne. It's a place where you can just sit and think without distraction. When's the last time you just stopped and thought about your life? Where you are, where you're going, how where you've been has shaped where you are, and how where you've been has prepared you for where you're going. See, we don't take time to think anymore. We don't like solitude. Got to be on the go all the time. Solitude, working alone, that's a training ground. Shepherds worked alone. It was them and the sheep. Had a lot of time to think. The second thing God used was obscurity. This is the place where character is built. You know, great men and women of God were first unknown, unseen, unappreciated, and unapplauded. God found obscure people, and he brought them to greatness. 
Gideon. I mean, Gideon. Gideon was this guy hiding in a cave, grinding grain to make bread. He was hiding from the Midianites. And Jesus shows up and says, Gideon, mighty man of valor. And he's like, who? Me? And he made him a great military general, brought him into battle, and they defeated the Midianites. But where, where was he found? In obscurity. Moses was hiding in Midian, hiding for his life from the Egyptians. And God found him. And he turned him into the great deliverer that delivered the people from Pharaoh. Mary, the mother of Jesus, a simple little poor girl in a little obscure village, Nazareth. Nothing would ever be known of her. So God found her and she became the mother of the humanity of our Savior. The disciples, what were they? <laughs> Everyday men. If you went down to the docks and you saw the disciples and you saw other fishermen, it'd be like, there's no difference. They didn't stand out from the other fishermen. They were just fishermen like everybody else. Just everyday, common, simple, obscure people. But when God was done with them, whew, wow. David, shepherd boy, eighth son, insignificant, youngest of the family. Oh, he's, he's in the field. Don't worry about him. You don't want him. Samuel said, I know you get another son, Jesse. Go get him. And that was the one. See, I like what one guy said. Those who first accept the silence of obscurity are best qualified to handle the applause of popularity. If you want to be a somebody, you got to start off being a nobody. If you want to start off being a somebody, then you'll never be a somebody. God takes nobodies and turns them into somebodies. He uses humble beginnings, small beginnings. Now that's good news because most of us have small beginnings. Maybe all of us. I don't know everybody here, but we come from, I would say, small beginnings, obscurity. You have no idea what God will do to you when it's all said and done. You have no idea. You can't even imagine what God will do and where God will place you. If you allow him, to, if you start off and see yourself as a nobody and let God make you into a somebody. So what does God use? Solitude, obscurity, monotony. What's monotony? This is being faithful in the menial, insignificant, routine, regular, unexcited, and uneventful daily tasks of life. The things that we do over and over and over, and it's like boring, monotonous. You know what it is? That's called life. That's what life is. Life can be monotonous. I remember when I was in high school, and you get your summer job, and I worked in a jewelry factory at 16, and I had to kick a foot press all day long. I don't even think they make them anymore. And I would connect links on a chain. Put the thing in, kick, kick, kick all day. Ow! Every fifth one, I caught my finger. And when the thing came down, boom, to smash the ring, my finger was there. I don't know how I have any fingers left after that job. But boring, with a capital ing. That was like monotonous. But, and I wasn't the only one. I looked down the row, man, a whole row of people doing the very same thing. Life can be boring, monotonous. I like the way one guy defined life. 
He said, it's, it's, it's like flying a plane. Hours and hours of monotony punctuated by sheer panic. Life in flying a plane, very, very similar. And maybe there are things in your life, man, it's like, this is just so monotonous. Same thing day after day after day. You know what that is? It's a training ground. It's a training ground. How do you do with the monotonous things? That's what God is trying to show you. Being a shepherd, what are you going to do today? Watch the sheep. What are you doing tomorrow? Watch the sheep. What are you going to do this weekend? Watch the sheep. That's it. You watch the sheep. But that was his training ground to be the next king. And by the way, he was the greatest king. <laughs> David was the greatest king of Israel. Why? Because he learned from solitude. He learned from obscurity. He learned from monotony. And you know what else he learned from? Reality. And what is reality? Reality is not what you think. Reality is the courage that comes from knowing God is with you. That's reality. We think reality is, oh, this is reality. Reality is, I'm struggling paying my bills. Reality is, oh, I got a sore back. Reality, reality is, all these things are happening to me. No, there's a reality that's even more real than that. God is with you. That's the greatest reality, that God is with you. And we need to zero in on that. We need to realize and remember that, wait a minute, everything that happens to me in life, some things are going to be really good right on. Some things are going to stink. God is always with me. Always. He's with me in my sickness and in my health. He's with me in my employment and my unemployment. He's with me when I'm popular. He's with me when nobody's around. That's reality. And knowing that God is with you all the time, that's the basis of your courage. Knowing that God is with you. That's your courage. That's where courage comes from. And it's real. Now look at 1 Samuel 17. Jump ahead. We have this scene Israel is at war with the Philistines. Philistines are on one hill. Israel's on the other hill. Big valley in the middle. And there's this loudmouth giant with the Philistines. And this guy's, he's like nine feet, six inches tall. I mean, he can dunk it with his mouth. Basket's ten feet. Picture a basketball hoop. His, his head is like six inches under it. He's three and a half feet above me. That's like, ah, oh, that's a big dude. And he's, he's cursing the army of Israel. And he's cursing God, speaking ill of God. Who's going to come out and fight me? Nobody wanted to fight this guy. Even King Saul, the biggest guy in Israel, wouldn't go out there. And fight him. So D David shows up at the battlefield. He's bringing lunch to his brothers. And he hears this giant cursing and speaking ill of God. And you know what he says? Isn't anybody going to go shut him up? And everybody's like, no, 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 not me. David says, I'll go. And you know what David's courage came from? He lived in reality. And he's like, hey, no one's going to speak ill of my God and get away with it. He didn't even see how big the, the giant was. He didn't care. What he cared about was, who's speaking ill against my God? That's all he cared about. He didn't care what the opposition was. Nobody speaks against my God. And you know what? You know how, you know if you really love someone, when someone speaks ill of them, and you shut them up. You don't let someone speak ill of another person that you love. You shut them up, whatever it takes. And that's what David's going to do with Goliath. So he goes to Saul and he says, I'm going to take this guy. 
And, and Saul said, no, man, you can't do that. You're just a teenager. These are seasoned soldiers, and they're not going to fight them. You're a teenager. You can't go out there. You're not going to fight them. You know what David said? 1 Samuel 17, verse 34. David said to King Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion and a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. And I went out after him and attacked him, and I rescued it from his mouth, and he rose up against me, and I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. There's a lesson there for lions. Shave your beard before you steal sheep. David said, hey, listen, I rescued a lamb from a lion. I rescued a lamb from a bear. I am not afraid. I fight for the, the helpless. I fight for the underdog. In verse 36, your servant killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. I guess that was a real insult in those days. He'll be like one of them since he's taunted the armies of the living God. I'm like, oh. David is saying, I'm not afraid. Because I live in God. And you know what happened? Saul said, well, all right, but listen. If you go fight him, you're going to wear my helmet, my armor, and take my shield and my spear. And David takes him. Remember, Saul's the biggest guy in Israel. David's a teenager. He puts him like, oh, man, I can't do this. It's not working for me, Saul. It's too big. He says, no, I know what to do. And, and you know, see, Saul tried to get David to fight Goliath on Goliath's ground. Goliath's way on Goliath's terms. Oh, David's smart. I'm not fighting him on his terms. I'm going to fight him on my terms. So he goes down to the river, gets some rocks. Hurls a rock at Goliath. Goliath can't even get close enough to David to use his weapons. David just flings a rock, <coughs> hits him in the head, knocks him down. Then he runs over there, grabs the giant sword, whack. Got his head. Now he's got his trophy case. The lion, the bear, and Goliath's head. Three victories. Why? Because he lived in the reality that God is always with him. And by the way, he knew because he said it. When he went out to battle, he said, hey, the battle's the Lord's. God's going to do this for me. All I have to do is show up. And I think of that, I go, wow. Hey, there are things in our life that try to intimidate us, that make us fearful. They're bigger than us. They're battles we have to fight. And we don't have to fear. You know what we do? Just show up. And the battles of the Lord's. It's amazing how God will come through for you if you just show up. Show up and wait and let God go to work. Two reasons God doesn't go to work. Number one, we don't show up. Or number two, we show up and then we try to do it ourselves. God is saying, no, you show up to show you believe, to show you have faith, and then just chill and watch me go to work. And he does every time. So we can learn a couple of lessons from God's schoolhouse of learning. Number one, it's in the little things and the lonely places that we prove ourselves capable of the bigger things. Hey, life has many lonely times. Maybe you work alone. And it's lonely. It's just you and your tools or whatever it is you're doing. If you want to be a person with a large vision, cultivate the habit of doing the little things well. The littlest things. Do them well. Detailed reports. Daily assignments. Homework. Chores. You might consider them insignificant. Nothing's insignificant when God is preparing you for greater things. Nothing. When you get up tomorrow morning, whether you work on a job or whether you work at home, the little things that you think are not that vital, they're very vital. Do them. And do them right. And do them faithfully. Because God is preparing you for greater things. This is how God works. He tells us, if you're faithful in the little things, oh, you'll be a ruler 
and greater things. So the little things are important for our training, whatever those little things might be. The test of one's calling is not how they're doing when the spotlight is on them, but when no one is looking. Again, there's the heart. Do you ever notice when we come to church, it's like everybody's on their best behavior. How you doing? Good. You look good. Yeah, you do too. Happy. Husbands and wives are kissing, holding hands. You know? Then they go home. Ah, how are you doing? <laughs> Life can be different outside the church than it is in the church. In church, we all have the best manners. Then we leave church, it's like, I'm cutting that guy off. I don't like the way he looked at me. You know, it's like, okay, so God, what he does, he, he's interested in who we are when no one else is around, when no one else is looking. You know, so here he is watching David in the pasture. No one else is around, just him and the sheep. And you know what God sees? A faithful little shepherd boy. That's what he sees. And when God sees you working alone or being alone, if he sees a faithful person, that's the person that he wants to exalt, that he wants to promote. The second lesson we can learn, when God develops our inner qualities, I hate this one. I wish this one wasn't true. When he develops our inner qualities, he's never in a hurry. I'm like, God, can't you speed it up, at least for me? He takes his time. You know, when, when Samuel said to Jesse, David's father, this is the next king, it was years before David was anointed king. Years. He had to be what? Trained. Prepared. That's why he had to spend years in solitude, obscurity, Monotony, living in the reality of God's presence. I like what one man said. The conversion of a soul, oh, that's the miracle of a moment. The manufacture of a saint, that's the task of a lifetime. It takes a whole lifetime to become what God would have you to be. So don't get discouraged. I mean, we all want to be there today. It takes time. In the first service, I said, you know, I'm over here, but I wish I was over there, farther ahead. And somebody came up to me after and said, well, maybe you're here and you wish you're over there, but at least you're not over there where you were. And I'm like, right. If I was over there, I'd fall off the stage. But you think about it, we're all in process and you're farther along than you think. And you're farther along than you were. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. You just keep baby steps. Bill Murray. What about Bob? Any theologians out there? Baby steps. Okay? So, our lesson today. What are we going to take home today? Beside the devotional. Do not be afraid of God's working in your life to prepare you for greater things. God is working. It's in the schoolhouse of solitude and obscurity that we learn to become men and women of God. It's from the schoolmasters of monotony and reality that we learn to be kings under God's calling. That's how we become like David, men and women after God's own heart. When you let these things teach you, don't complain about them. Don't run from them. Let them teach you. And you will develop a heart after God. Next week, we're going to see God always has a plan. In spite of how things might look, God always has a plan. He's not like making it up as he goes along. He always has a plan a plan. And we'll see how that works in our life next week. Let's bow our heads as we get ready.